So hello everyone and welcome to the sixth of this year's webinars today on the topic of structural proteomics. We're joined by two speakers, Dr. Mark Scahill and Dr. Francis O'Reilly, alongside our guest chair for today, Dr. Michael Hoopman. Michael will chair the question and answer session uh, after both talks in a roundtable discussion with our speakers. So now I just have a few of the usual housekeeping points to go over before I hand over to our guest chair to introduce the first speaker. As always, we're using our Slack channel for question and discussion. So please join us there to ask questions, use the thumbs up to let us know which questions you'd like to hear answered and direct your questions to each of the speakers by naming them as we'll be having the joint Q&A and round table after both talks. For those of you who will need a certificate of attendance for this webinar, the details will be available on how to get this after our last slide. So once again, we'd like to say a big thank you to the European Proteomics Association, the British Society for Proteome Research, the Young Proteomics Investigators Club, and the London Proteomics Discussion Group Committee for their help and support in setting up this webinar. And thanks also to the London Biological Mass Spectrometry Discussion Group, the London Metabolomics Network, and the News in Proteomics Research blog for promoting this event. We're also grateful for Imperial College London for providing us with the webinar support. And thanks also to our YouTube channel subscribers. Uh, the talks will be available to watch again online after the event. So thanks to our guest chair, I'm gonna introduce Michael and then he's gonna introduce our speakers. So Michael Hoopman is from the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, and his research is focused on proteomics technologies and method development, having been trained in both instrumentation and software data analysis, with particular focus on high resolution mass spectrometry. His current interests are in the development of advanced algorithms for discovery based proteomics. He is the developer of the Kojak algorithm, a versatile open source software application for the discovery of protein protein interactions through shotgun based mass spectrometry. And he's also a contributor to the Transproteomic Pipeline suite of software solutions for mass spectrometry data analysis. So um, I will hand over to Michael, who has very kindly got up at a ridiculous hour this morning uh, to, to chair our session for us. So it's over to you, uh, Michael. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Thank you, Joanna, for the introduction and uh, for the invitation and opportunity to uh, chair this uh, session. Uh, so our first speaker is Dr. Mark Skeho from the Francis Crick Institute. Uh, Dr. Skeho received his Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry with biochemistry from King's College London. He then took a position as higher scientific officer in John E. Walker's lab at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, applying protein sequencing techniques for subunit characterization of bovine mitochondrial NADH ubiquitone oxidoreductase. He was awarded a PhD in 1994, and in 1998, he joined Smith Klein Beecham before returning to academic science in 2007, setting up a biological mass spectrometry lab at Cancer Research UK. In 2012, he returned to the LMB as head of bio biological MS and proteomics before joining the Crick as head of the proteomics STP this year. Today, Mark will discuss the application of cyclic IMS to hydrogen deuterium exchange studies to investigate the so-called active and deactive conformations of bovine mitochondrial complex one. And uh, with that, I'll let you take over, Mark. Okay, thank you very much, Michael, for that introduction. <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much to the LPDG for, uh, for asking me to give the, the talk today. So uh, I'll get straight on with it. Um, um, there are quite a few slides, but a lot of them are really just, uh, just uh, it won't take too long. It just helps describe what we're talking about. So um, the last time I spoke about any of this work, I was at this chromosome shaped building in uh, in Cambridge. Um, and I, uh, sorry, the slides move slightly slowly. So even though I've clicked that, nothing's happening just yet. Here we go. I've now moved to a, another chromosome shaped building in the, in the centre of London. So I've moved from the LMB to the Crick, um, and that's where we're going to be carrying on doing some of these studies in the proteomics group there. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is expanding um, the subunit complexity that we can look at by uh, HDXMS uh, using the, the new Waters uh, uh, Select Cyclic uh, uh, QTOF mass spec. Um, we don't have one of this, these yet, so this was a uh, um, a demonstration that we undertook with Malcolm Anderson at Waters uh, in October last year. So what we focused on primarily is a uh, is a peptide centric, if you like, bottom up 
um, uh, methods of looking at uh, uh, protein interactions and structure by mass spec. So um, you, you've obviously got the, the covalent labeling approaches, things like carbenes and, and reactive uh, hydroxyls, uh, FPOP and that kind of stuff. Uh, chemical cross-linking, uh, which we've done quite a lot of, but Francis is going to um, uh, talk about that later. Um, and hydrogen deuterium exchange, MS, which is uh, which is what I'm going to talk about today and another area that we've been primarily focusing on. Um, all of these, of course, what we're trying to do is link them in with cryo-EM, X-ray and, and NMR, but really cryo-EM and X-ray to help um, uh, um, uh, give information on interactions and help improve the resolution of the structures generated. OK, so I'll give an overview of HDX just to get everybody on the same page. You've probably all heard it quite a few times now, but I think it's still worthwhile getting everybody together. A tiny bit about eye mobility and then we'll go on to the, the, the cyclic. OK, so HDX MS, uh, I've ripped this straight out of uh, Bing Deng's publication, but I think it, it shows the uh, I, I just show it to, 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 to make the point that um, HDX as a technique uh, is, is gaining in popularity over the last uh, 20 years, if you like. Um, and this only goes up to 2015. I'm sure the publications are, are way up there now. And mainly that's because originally, you know, it was, uh, it was an academic pursuit, but with improving instrumentation and, and software, it's gradually been picked up by the pharmaceutical industry to, to look at uh, antibody interactions and episode mapping. So it's a very powerful technique, uh, which is uh, used widely these days. Um, and this was taken from from Glenn's uh, uh, Nature paper a little while ago, which was sort of talking about um, uh, sort of the way you should be doing these experiments. And, and the, the only reason I was showing this was was to make the same point that he was, is that it's used for HDXMS is used for a, a wide variety of, of approaches from, um, you know, looking at uh, uh, looking at DNA one in, in the E. coli replosome, looking at exonuclease activity, um, looking at viral capsid proteins and how they change in structure on temperature and how that affects antibody binding. Um, Glenn was looking at some single nucleate, uh, getting single residue um, um, uh, resolution uh, when looking at small molecule binding, and he was using ETD to do that. So, you know, there's a, there's a wide range of applications that you can use uh, HDXMS from. And here, this, this one uh, was from Roger Williams's lab where they were looking at, uh, at uh, protein lipid interfaces uh, um, and looking at the binding there. So it has a wide variety of applications. So what are we looking at with uh, with HDX? We're looking at the exchange of deuterium for uh, amide hydrogens. Of course, within the peptide bond, you can imagine that there are essentially three classes of hydrogen, if you like. Um, the amide uh, backbone hydrogens, which are colored here in red, um, the carbon hydrogen uh, uh, bonds, and, and, then the, and then the side chain hydrogens. Um, the carbon hydrogen bonds in green are, exchange very, very slowly, if at all. So, so we're not looking at those. The side chain hydrogens exchange very quickly. Um, and essentially, we don't have a method that we can use well in, in solution to to uh, to quench that reaction. So, so we can't look at those. Um, but the the amide hydrogen exchange at a rate that we can that we can measure it by uh, by mass spec. Um, so what we're looking at is solvent accessibility. Um, the degree of hydrogen bonding um, and, and, and the and temperature and pH affect the, the rate of, of HD exchange. OK, so we make use of that fact. OK, so what you do is you label your protein uh, and your protein complex with deuterium at a physiological pH. And then in order to, to quench that reaction, you rapidly lower the pH to around 2.5 in acid and you snap freeze it in liquid nitrogen. And essentially you freeze the reaction at that point. OK, so we, we've, we've measured, we've maintained that condition and we're preventing back exchange. OK, because, of course, you're, you're exchanging hydrogen for deuterium, but it wants to go the other way as well. So by reducing the pH and the temperature, we're, we're taking a snapshot at that moment. OK, so essentially, you know, what's HDX telling us? Well, it's telling us about the, the conformation of the protein, the accessibility of those amide hydrogens to bulk solvent. And it's just telling us something about the hydrogen bonding as this reaction here is, is, the, is the rate limiting step, if you like. The abstraction of that hydrogen by this deuteroxide ion is the rate limiting step. So it's telling us whether it's free in solution or whether it's hydrogen bonded. So the rate of that reaction tells us something about the environment of, of that hydrogen. OK. Next, so this is this is the rough 
this is a very schematic uh, slide just to tell you to how, how we do these things. So um, it's a time course reaction. You have your, your protein alone or your protein in complex or with a ligand. Um, you react it with, with D2O. Um, you quench that reaction, as I've just mentioned, in, with, by pH and temperature. You digest with pepsin. Um, pepsin is active at, uh, at pH 2. So we can use that to generate uh, peptides as we're a very peptide centric approach. We analyze it in the MS uh, and look for incorporation of deuterium. And then we've got all this software. Uh, the dynamics is, is the software we use from, from waters at the moment. OK, so uh, here's just a trace showing you um, um, uh, the, the base peak intensities of a non deuterated peptide uh, digest. OK, so you can see that this is over very quickly. The whole business end of this takes about 12 minutes. Um, we've got MS to the E, which we're using to generate um, sequence information. But at the MS level, everything's over in about 12 minutes. So for us, the, the big problem in expanding what you're looking at in complexity is that you've got all your peptides from whatever you're looking at eluting in 12 minutes. So if you're a prote in proteomics, as many people have discussed in these sessions before, we're looking at fractionation, extending the gradient to get peptide numbers up. We, you can't do that here, OK, because you, you're, you're limited by back exchange. As soon as you linger in the chromatogram, you're going to be exchanging deuterium for hydrogen. You can't do that. Everything's got to be quick. So what happens is you get overlapping peptides. You can't use those in the analysis. So you are limited a little bit in the, in the size. When I say size, I mean number of potentially number of subunits in a complex. OK, so one way around that has been to use just quickly go through this, the, the eye mobility capability of the synapse. So we've been using the Synapse GTOSI for most of these studies, where by you, 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 you have the added value of an eye mobility or, or if you like gas phase separation of your ions, where they separate on the basis of their uh, collisional cross-sectional shape, if you like. And that's helped us out for looking at things like this. This is this is this is looking at the um, messenger RNA 3 prime m processing machinery with Laurie Passmore. So in fact, we were just looking at one of these uh, these uh, domains here within, within the enzyme. So if you look here at the, the eye mobility, you've got, I think, drift time on the y-axis here. And, and if you take a slice through that and flip it through, you can see that there are a number of features coming off at that same time, OK? And then if we move on, oh, oh how do I go back? Doesn't matter. We'll forget that. Basically, in the in the ion mobility, if you have two closely eluting ions uh, of a similar mass but with a different mobility, we can separate those. And the next slide was simply to show you two ions which were, were within one Dalton, which we would have lost normally because as you incorporate deuterium, your your uh, isotopic envelope increases and and you you lose them from your analysis. So eye mobility is key to being able to expand. Um, what you can look at. So we were very excited um, when uh, a couple of years ago Waters um, uh, launched this uh, cyclic um, eye mobility instrument um, because you have the ability to, uh, you know, your, 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 your eye mobility separation is improved because you can let it spin around. In fact, even it's, it's a longer tube, if you like. Um, so the resolution in mobility is already increased and it has a, a, a new um, um, a time of flight analyzer. So now we've got um, resolution up to 60K and 100K in, in, in W mode. So this, this instrument potentially um, had a lot of advantages for looking at uh, highly complex structures. OK, so here's, here's a quick look at, 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 uh, at the cyclic and why it's important here you can see as, as it says, cyclic, you've got a, a, a circular eye mobility cell, this T-wave eye mobility cell. Um, turns out probably this step wave at the beginning is important. Um, uh, we seem to get reduced. This is a bit of a hand wavy empirical sort of uh, statement, but I think we get reduced background with this step wave. Um, sorry, re reduced back exchange. And, and this array here is, is key to the instrument. So your ions come in, they can either be allowed to go around the, the, uh, the, the, the eye mobility, uh, uh, well, um, I guess, ferrous wheel, if you like, or as many times as you like, and then the array diverts them into the top. Or if you want to select a particular species as they come round, you can use the array to pull it back, let everything else uh, go away and then reintroduce that species. And I think that's particularly useful. Um, I think Andy Pitt's using that kind of stuff for lipids and things like this. So, so it, is, it is a useful instrument. And here, here's something, this, this end here, it, it, um, the TOF, has really helped to improve resolution as well. 
Okay, so so what we're looking at is, is is complex one, and I'll come on to that again in a second. These are the kind of conditions that Malcolm was using. He was using the robot. We generally do this by hand, but he was using the the liquid handling that they have. So you know, we're we're not we're not shy on protein amounts. We've got a thirty around forty mg per mil uh, solution here of complex one, and we're finally injecting about twenty one uh, micrograms. Um, the quench conditions, uh, we're using off uh, potassium phosphate, uh, guanidine and, and TCEP. OK, these tend to be a little bit um, empirical. I think it's important when you're doing HDX uh, experiments to work out the best quench um, for you. Sometimes it's something very simple, but we found with some of these membrane complexes, uh, potassium phosphate is very useful. And, and Patrick Griffin was using that for some time, I think, uh, over the scripts. I won't go over too many as you can look at that. Uh, and these are conditions that, of course, we're using water's columns, the, the bridge ethyl hybrid columns, the uh, the ends, the pepsin is the enzymate column. I apologize for this. These didn't come over very well. Obviously, this is time, this is uh, flow rate, and this is the percent of, of solvent B. OK, so you can see it's a very fast gradient, as I was describing earlier. Um, Let's carry on. OK, so here's the cyclic. In fact, we only Malcolm only used fairly default settings for this. So it, the, the, the ions were only making one pass of, of the ion mobility region. OK, and, and everything else was fairly standard. I think um, he was I think you can probably get these online afterwards if you want to go into it. He was he was looking in V mode. Uh, between 15 and 2000, all fairly standard stuff, I think. Um, but the higher resolution that we're getting from the from the added distance in mobility and the time of flight helped us out. OK, so that's the system we're using. What have, been, what have we been looking at? Well, we're looking at um, um, mitochondrial complex one, the NADH ubiquin and oxidoreductase. It's the first uh, and largest enzyme in the in the uh, in the mitochondrial uh, respiratory chain. Uh, it's got 45 subunits uh, with a combined mass of about one megadalton. Uh, there are 14 conserved subunits. They're conserved in bacteria and, and eukaryotes. Um, and they're required for catalysis. And so in the mammalian system, there are about 31 supernumerary subunits, which are presumably required for assembly and, uh, and stability and, and potentially regulation, I guess. OK, so, so this is complex one. It sits in the mitochondrial inner membrane. It's the first enzyme in the respiratory chain. It pumps protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane, which then drive ATP synthesis of this. OK, here we go. So looking at that a bit closer, um, it's a complex one is a key enzyme in, in, in oxidative phosphorylation. Um, it's responsible for the oxidation of NADH produced in the TCA cycle or beta oxidation um, or, or, the, or the degradation of, of other proteins. Um, and uh, what happens is it, it pumps four protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane. OK, so NADH comes in, in here. Uh, it's it's oxidized by this uh, FMN and then the, then the, the electrons are transferred through this, these ion sulfur centers to ubiquinone, which sort of sits in the membrane. OK, so you get a, um, a, a pumping of protons across here. And, and what that does is generate this electrochemical gradient for protons across the membrane, which is then used by the ATP synthase to drive the synthesis of ATP. And I should say it says at the bottom there, thanks to Judy Hurst, a lot of these slides have come from Judy because we've been collaborating with her for, for this stuff. So what was noticed some time ago when when uh, actually before the CryEM stuff came out, I think the, the, there was some um, Alexander Galkin was doing some experiments with crosslinkers where they could see there were potentially some different conformations. But certainly in the CryEM, uh, it became clear that there were different uh, complex one existed in different states. And these were termed then the active or deactive or deactive or, 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 or dormant state, if you like. OK, uh, and and it looked like what was happening is this is a kind of an L shape so that in, in the deactive form, they sort of slightly opened up and you can see that the studies that, that this that the subunits are moving sort of in this region here, this 42 K is moving about three angstroms. And then here, there's sort of an, uh, I think I can't really read that. I think it's about seven angstrom movement here between the, the heel and, and, and this hydrophilic domain. So that, that's one thing I should point out. Complex one is essentially two regions, if you like, this sort of extra membranous globular hydrophilic domain uh, and then the and then the hydrophobic domain here. OK, and the subunits that we initially wanted to look at were in the interface between these two, um, the 42 kilodalton subunit, which is also called NDUFA10 and the B13 subunit, which is called NDUFA5. 
Okay, so so here's just a, what we wanted to look at was actually the quinone binding site, which comes in here, um, and how that might be different between the two states. So it turns out that you can deactivate complex one at 37 degrees. At 37 degrees, it adopts this sort of more open conformation, and you can um, you can there's a reactive cysteine, cysteine 39 on this ND3, which is a mitochondrial encoded subunit, and there's a loop between the first transmembrane helix six and the second. You can react that reactive cysteine with uh, any thiolamide or some other thiol reactive compound, and you can block the, uh, the 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 complex in that deactive deactive form. Okay, so we can then look at that uh, in by exchange. So all these experiments are comparing those two. Um, here, if if you if you look at, at the complex, uh, we first started wanting to look at uh, uh, FA5 and FA10 because um, they form the only interactions between, apart from the sort of buried domain here. So in the active form, um, this is sort of a 400 angstrom uh, interaction here with three salt bridges and three hydrogen bonds. And in the deactive form, it's only about 200 angstroms with one hydrogen bond and one salt bridge. So this, this interaction here between uh, FA5 and FA10 is probably important for, for sort of stabilizing maybe that interaction in, in the active form. And this is some work by Judy's group a little while ago that just to show the uh, just show the the movement of the helices in in FA5 uh, between the two states. Okay. So the subunits I, I've spoken about before have been B13 and 42, the NDFA5 and, and 10, but we, well, I'm going to tell you about another two that we've looked at here uh, today. Um, you can the, the reason for showing this slide, I apologize for it being so small, is just to show you that the increased coverage we get with the cyclic compared to the to the synapse. And that's actually been quite ex important. And I'll, I'll show you why in a second. These are the mitochondrially encoded hydrophobic subunits. Um, you can see that we um, there's somebody at my front door. <laughs> uh, you can see I'm giving a talk. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, fine. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, yeah, these are the hydrophobic mitochondrial encoded subunits that actually are quite difficult to get sequence coverage of. And the, and the cyclic is getting us there, but the coverage still isn't particularly good. OK, I hope I haven't forgotten to tell you anything there. OK, so this is complex one. This is kind of the, the I've coded in green just to just to show you this is taken straight from the PDB. You can see here the iron sulfur clusters coming through the hydroph hydrophilic domain and the, and the the quinone binding site is in here. OK, so now if we if we color that gray and I'll just color in the, uh, the subunits that we're going to mention here today, the green one is, is the 42, the NDU FA10, the blue is the 39 kilogram subunit NDU FA9. This is NDUFA5 in magenta, and, and then NDUFS7, or also known as PSST, is, is the one behind the 39, slightly buried. And then this is just an, another view to show you where we're looking. Right, okay, so here, here we go with, with sequence coverage. This is this is NDUFA10, or the 42 kiloton subunit. Uh, I apologize in many of these, we didn't remove the, uh, the mitochondrial uh, um, import sequence. So actually the coverage is slightly better than it shows you there. But you can see straight away that we're getting much, much more uh, peptide coverage. Um, and the reason for that is here. So the, here before, in, in, in probably in the synapse, and certainly if you're using an ordinary TOF, you wouldn't be able to resolve these two but the peptides, but they have a different mobility. So the resolution in the eye mobility and, and the TOF would allow us to separate these two. So our sequence coverage increases. And then if we look at this is this is the kind of information you get from this. This is a butterfly plot in the active and deactive state. Uh, the gray is the, the, the error in the background. And we're looking at the time course here. Um, and then, of course, this, this is a difference approach. So that butterfly plot is quite difficult to look at. So if you take the two states away from each other, you can see anything above the line here is a peptide. Each black dot is a peptide, um, is, is, is a region that's exposed in, in the active form compared to the deactive. And here we have protected regions. So in NDUF10, if we then map that on the structure, you can see that between the active and deactive state, the blue are protected and the red is, 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 is exposed more to bulk solvent. So as that closes, you can see that part of it is kicked out. These alpha helices are kicked out probably, and, and, and these are forming increased contacts here between the hydrophobic domain and the hydrophilic domain. And then again for FA5, there's very good coverage there. 
Um, nice butterfly. Actually, these are qu these are quite uh, interesting in themselves. You can see this is a large region of disordered uh, protein structure, and here we probably have alpha helices. And you can actually see that, and here taking it away, that in in in, in FA5 there's a region uh, mostly exposed. And so if we map that now, this is the if we just zoom in here, you can see it's these alpha helices that are that are exposed in the active form and that's probably as it moves in they get slightly kicked out and then you can see here this is that large region of uh, of unstructured um, sequence that we could we could see in 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 the hdx uh, <clears throat> this is the 39 kilodalton subunit again you can see extensively lots of lots of alpha helices and, and loop regions did that move OK, and, and again, the main regions in the 39 are, are, are protected uh, between the active and, and, and between the active and active form. And you can see here this actually 39 is quite on the side. So probably as it moves in, this alpha helices is packing against the subunit above here, which I have actually haven't identified, but that's not part of the 39. And then if we move finally on to FS7, which is slightly more buried, and, and, and here this is this is a quite a, quite a, 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 an interesting looking uh, butterfly plot. But if we look at it, there isn't much going on, but there are a couple of regions potentially. I wish I could go back potentially showing um, um, some some protection and I've mapped those onto these buried structures. In fact, right. OK, so here the, these are these are regions that just potentially showing something going on. And then when we put them on here, actually, what what has been found in the, in the cryostructure that this this subunit is seated very close to the to the uh, the, the region where uh, the electrons are transferred to ubiquitin. I don't mean ubiquitin. I mean quinone. You know. Okay, the, the, the electrons are transferred, and the changes between the active and deactive form are very subtle in the cry AM. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing in in with HD exchange. We do see something, but it's very subtle. So uh, just finally to, to, to wrap it up, I think the, the, the approach, I mean, I hope I've showed you that it's useful for looking at multi subunit complexes and in between two different states, but I think HDX is going to be and all these approaches actually cross linking and everything are, are really going to be useful looking at uh, intrinsically disordered proteins. And of course, there's a there's a huge uh, push to look at those now as, in, as they're involved in 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 in, uh, in, 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 in control and, and mechanistic studies of, of proteins and how they act. So I think it's a very useful technique because because you're not really looking at those unstructured regions by cryo or, uh, or X-ray crystallography. So, OK, powerful biophysical technique provides insights into protein structure. I think the cyclic is going to be very useful. It's really helped us find regions that in the synapse, I haven't shown you these, I've taken a few slides out in the synapse, we didn't see any changes, but using the cyclic, we could see those changes and it's allowed us to, 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 to really uh, investigate what's going on. And we're going to carry on doing that with the 49 kilodalton subunit to look at that, uh, that quinone binding site. Uh, did I hit the go button then? So, OK, I should say thanks to Malcolm Anderson. He did, he did his experiments up at Waters. Uh, great effort on his behalf, really. Uh, um, hadn't worked with this level of complexity before. He did really well. Um, and Judy Hurst for riding the, the, the this is a great interaction with Judy, who's just recently taken over as uh, as director of the mitochondrial biology unit in Cambridge. OK, thank you very much. I hope I was within time there. That was a bit of a speedy. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, Mark. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, so we're, we're going to hold off on, on questions for the um, discussion at the, uh, the second talk, uh, which brings us to our, our second presenter, uh, which is uh, who is Dr. Francis O'Reilly from the Berlin Institute of Technology. So Dr. O'Reilly studied at the University of Edinburgh, where he obtained a master's by research in structural biology. Following this, he completed his PhD studies at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg, where he developed methods to structurally study protein complexes in cell lysates. Currently, he is a postdoctoral fellow at the Technical University in Berlin in Professor Yuri Rafsilber's lab, where he is using proteomics and electron microscopy to study structure of protein complexes inside cells. Francis's talk today will focus on using crosslinking MS, where he will show that the powerful combination of in-cell crosslink Cross-linking mass spectrometry and cryo-electron microscopy can expand our understanding of even well-characterized protein complexes. Uh, so thank you, Francis, for uh, being here, and I'll let you uh, start. 
Uh, thank you, Michael, for the nice introduction and thank you for the organizers for inviting me. So um, indeed, I'm going to talk about cross linking mass spectrometry and how we've been developing uh, developing it to to be useful inside uh, inside cells and other in situ um, scenarios. So uh, why? Next slide. OK, um, so. The, the question is, why, why do we even want to study um, study things in situ? So I think that we, uh, I think actually we have, uh, as um, as Bells, a pretty good now understanding of the the soluble core um, uh, stable complexes from uh, um, from human cells and and other model organisms. But uh, this is this is typically done by affinity pull down uh, purifications or by co-fractionation studies. But these really focus on on, on soluble interactions, and uh, and those that survive lysing a cell. So I, I think there's a lot a lot of things that we've missed. So those that are um, that are mediated by molecular crowding or membrane interactions or DNA RNA or uh, or other other things that require the um, the circumstances inside the cell. So the idea of a cross linking uh, cross linking is that you can add a chemical that will covalently link nearby residues. So then it fixes the, struc the, uh, the structural information that these residues were nearby. Then you can digest all of the, the proteins and then read out which, uh, which peptides were linked together. And then you infer that they were, um, they were nearby in, in the original system. So how does the, um, I'll just describe what the workflow of cross mass spectrometry is. So typically you start with, um, with, with a cross linker and these are quite, there's many available, um, but they have, uh, they have two important important components. So they have reactive groups. So here I'm showing NHS esters, and these react with um, uh, these react with lysines predominantly, but also with serine, threonine, and tyrosine side chains. And then you have the spacer part, and this is what's left over um, after the reaction has happened. So this is left uh, left linking the residues together, and these can can contain uh, either just a simple inert carbon chain, or they can have uh, other chemistries to make them enrichable or um, or cleavable in the mass spec. So the quite standard workflow, which is uh, has is um, has now been applied at many core facilities and many labs around the world. So you add your cross linker typically to a, um, a purified complex. You then digest, uh, you, after the reaction is complete, you digest this uh, th this protein or protein complex. And then you're left with a mixture of cross link peptides and what we call linear peptides, so, so typical um, uh, triptych peptides. The cross linking occurs substoichiometrically, so there's a huge abundance difference between the um, uh, the linear peptides and the cross link peptides. So you have to do some form of enrichment, either by size, uh, because cross link peptides are, are larger, or you can separate them by charge because they have. Um, each, each, there's two n terminis and tend to be more positively charged. Um, and then you uh, you acquire in the mass spec. We uh, typically use or, um, uh, the orbit traps because they give us a uh, nice high resolution because you have, uh, uh, then you have to have um, specialized search software, which uh, Michael knows a lot about, haven't produced one of them. And this, uh, this you have chimeric spectra. So you have spectra that contain two, um, uh, Two peptides, but also fragments of one peptide linked to part of the other peptide. So uh, this is quite a specialized area. And then you uh, you have uh, so obviously some sort of FDR filter. Then you do visualization, and um, from this you can go back and and uh, you know build build a structural model or or, um, or 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 test your hypothesis. So for in cell cross linking, this adds or even complex mixtures like uh, lysates, this adds um, uh, presents new challenges. So instead of a, a purified system, you're adding your cross linker to um, two whole cells. It's something quite, something quite complex. So not only do you have the dynamic range between the linear peptides and the cross link peptides, you have this across the entire dynamic uh, 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 dynamic range of abundances of the entire proteome. Then you uh, uh, then what we typically do is quite extensive fractionation. So we'll like, we'll um, fractionate maybe into. 20 fractions by strong cation exchange, and then we'll take each of those fractions and fraction it again by strong anion exchange after we, after we flip the pH. Then we do maybe weeks of mass spec acquisition time, and then uh, the database search is much the same, but the, um, the potential peptides that can be, uh, um, that can be matched is, is huge now. So we, we really require quite high resolution on our MS2. 
And then we do um, what we uh, visualization provided some challenges. Our lab produces visualization software to help with this. And, uh, and one thing I want to discuss, aside from uh, the rest of these uh, technical challenges that I think we have, you know, we have uh, we've made good progress on, is uh, is FDR filter. So previous, um, uh, we're not the only lab that does this work on uh, on generating interaction networks with uh, with crossing mass spectrometry, but there has been. Uh, criticism in the past that the um, interaction networks that are, are produced have a certain amount of useful information and then over the top is layered with a lot of uh, a lot of false positives and then if another lab wants to you know bet a phd student on validating one of these interactions it can be quite uh, it, it can be quite a challenge so we decided to uh, see if we could work on this false discovery rate issue um for for discovering protein protein interactions so what we did here was uh uh, we, we took an E. coli lysate and separated by size exclusion chromatography, similar to what you see people who do cofractionation MS do. And then we cross-linked each individual fraction. So here we had 44 fractions. So this is from large complex to small complexes. We cross-linked them separately. Then we mixed all of the, that uh, cross material again um, to simulate uh, the dynamic range and complexity of a, of a simple cell. Then we did our, um, our fractionation, our mass spec um, acquisitions. Um, and we did this with multiple crosslinkers, and then this allowed us to, to do multiple um, uh, to test multiple false discovery rate uh, methods. And uh, then in parallel, we just did our standard quantitative proteomics, uh, quantitative proteomics on each of these uh, on each of these fractions, generated uh, elution profiles, and this uh, allowed us to generate a known um, uh, false positive. So proteins that weren't colluding, if we called them as being crosslinked together, this is a known false positive. So how is um, False discovery rates estimated in cosmic mass spectrometry. So it's we use the um, target decoy approach, like you do in standard proteomics. Uh, the only difference there is that you have two peptides, so you can you can uh, not only do you have target targets linked together, you can have target linked to a decoy, or you can have decoy linked to decoy. So for all intents and purposes here, everything that has a decoy sequence, target decoys and decoy decoys, I'm going to call a decoy or false match. So like in um, uh, like in standard proteomics. So this is uh, um, this error propagation is something that we uh, we realize had to be dealt with in standard proteomics. You have um, PSMs, peptide spectral matches. They merge together into um, into protein groups. Here um, in crossing mass spectrometry, you have CSMs, a crossing spectral match. Several crossing spectral matches um, can represent one residue pair. So this is two um, uh, two let's say lysines linked together. And then several residue pairs can represent um, uh, protein protein interactions that, that, that you, um, you identify. The difference between true matches and false matches is that true matches will, will typically um, merge as you go up between these groups. So true CSMs will often represent true, um, uh, so a few residue pairs and a few true residue pairs will represent um, true uh, and protein interactions. So the, uh, the lesson here is that you must, whatever, level of information you want to report. So if you want to report protein interactions, you should do your, first of all, you should merge all your um, your targets and your decoys together uh, that represent each protein interaction prior to doing your false discovery rate estima estimation. So in uh, in uh, uh, here's an example where you have a 10% CSM um, error, you have 10, uh, 10 CSMs and one of them is wrong. But when you, when you report your protein protein interactions, this actually is one in four of them is wrong, which is uh, a very high error rate for a protein interaction screen. So, um, so how did this how did this uh, work on our um, on, on our data set that we produced? So we we showed that some group groups in the past had done a five percent um, CSM uh, FDR and had reported their protein interactions um, uh, based on that. So if we did this in our data set. We actually um, if we did a five percent um, CSM or uh, CSM level FDR. We could get up to a almost fifty percent false discovery rate on the on the protein interactions. And then if you do it on residue pairs, it's it's reduced. And then when you do it on pro on the protein uh, interaction level, you get down to close to ten percent. We still double the error that you you estimated. There was another another thing we we did, which people in the field have been discussing for quite a long time, is that you must separate prior to your false discovery rate estimation all of your links. That are within proteins, so your intra protein links, and all of them that are between proteins. And this allows, uh, um, this is because they have different search spaces. I don't have to go into that in much detail here, but when you, when you do this, your, um, your false discovery rate is uh, the, um, the, 
estimated and the observed uh, agree with each other. So this is fantastic. This allowed us to be confident that when we um, when we applied this false discovery rate estimation correctly, we could then be confident in the uh, in the interactions that we then reported. So in this data set, this E. coli lice set, we we're able to report an interaction network. Remember, this was crossing in the lice set, so this possibility that there are some artifactual um, interactions here of prote proteins that just bump into each other, but um, um, but in general, it was uh, it, it separated into known complexes very nicely. And what we were able to see in this, so this is 1% false discovery rate on protein interactions, that in these 786 uh, PPIs, here attached uh, to the uh, RNA polymerase, we had this known binder of RNA polymerase in USG and this uncharacterized protein YACL. So we thought we'll uh, see if uh, this interaction with YACL and the RNA polymerase is real. We um, we had our coalition data, which showed that the RNA polymerase, YACL and NUSG nicely um, correlated uh, together, uh, coalited together. And then we pulled down YACL, and it, it it in turn pulled down the RNA polymerase, which was uh, which is very nice results. And then when we cross-linked with uh, photo cross-linking, so sulfur SDA cross-linking on uh, to give us lots of uh, cross-links, we um, this uh, this pull down. We were able to localize with the distance restraints and the cross-linking YACL to the um, to the DNA exit tunnel with the cross-linked distance restraints. So this shows that not only can you identify novel protein interactions with cross-linking, you can also use the distance restraints to model uh, potential interfaces of these interactions, and that that allows you to then go back and uh, and generate potential uh, uh, potentially um, mutants that will uh, allow you to disrupt this interaction and confirm um, what its function is. Okay. So now we've done, uh, uh, this was working very nicely in, um, in Lysate. We had done a lot of optimization of every aspect of the, of the protocol and to, um, uh, on, this, on this data set. We then uh, turned to see, could we, could we uh, work on a biological uh, story inside um, a full cell? So we thought it would make it easy on ourselves. We decided to study um, mycoplasma pneumonia, which is a very simple organism. It only has 800 uh, or 700 genes. And we're studying transcription and translation, which is um, which is uh, which uh, coupling, which are also quite abundant um, uh, systems inside this uh, uh, or comp abundant complexes inside this organism. So, mycoplasma pneumonia has, um, like I say, has 707 genes, and it has all the typical um, omics has been done on this organism. Just for uh, for those of us that know proteomics, this is the uh, uh, the complexity of the proteome is that if you do a, a three-hour um, acquisition on the um, on the lumos, you get about you can identify about 550 proteins, and um, a lot of uh, systems biology has been done on this organism, including they're trying to uh, um, in the Broad Institute they're trying to use its uh, its cousin for uh, for whole cell computational model of the cell. Interestingly, even though all this omics has been done, up to, um, roughly 30 percent of the genes still have unknown function. So why do we want to study uh, transcription and translation coupling? So um, aside from being a, an interesting system uh, the, where the ribosome can, because uh, there's no nucleus obviously in bacteria, the ribosome can, can directly um, interact with the, uh, the leading ribosome can interact with the, um, with the RNA polymerase. And this was shown to have some, uh, some uh, functional significance in E. coli. And what it does is the ribosome will stop um, uh, will will block the mRNA and prevent intrinsic termination or Rome AD determination inside uh, inside, inside E. coli. Um, in my in my PhD lab, actually, uh, they had done the APMS uh, interaction screen um, of uh, of mycoplasma pneumonia, and they were able to pull down some parts of the ribosome when they pulled on the RNA polymerase, and vice versa. But the uh, any interaction seemed to be too. Um, uh, too labile to really uh, structurally study. So I thought, well, let's let's see if we can study it inside the cell. Um, the, uh, there have been some previous models of what this interaction could look like from uh, from E. coli. So one from from 2015, where they showed that um, it, that NUSG, so uh, this um, uh, uh, transcriptional el elongation factor, one one uh, domain of it would bind the ribosome, and one domain would bind the RNA polymerase. And they proposed that this uh, it was NUSG that would couple the two um, uh, two complexes, and then uh, in 2017, when we were actually when we were working on this, Patrick Kramer's lab um, came out with this model where they had the RNA polymerase in in vitro. They stalled it, and then they ran the ribosome along the RNA um, 
uh, into the right into the RNA polymerase, and then they solve this complex, which they call express so so this uh, complex of the RNA polymerase and the ribosome together. So this in this uh, complex is that there's no room for NUSG or any other um, anything else between the RNA polymerase and the ribosome. So we uh, we then decide to crosslink the um, uh, the mycoplasmas, these micrographs. And we crosslink with uh, two millimolar DSSO, which is an MST level crosslinker. So this uh, uh, it cleaves in the mass spec, and, the, and, and then this aids aids our identification on the uh, with the MS2. Um, and then we applied the pipeline, as I, I discussed earlier, in the E. coli lysate. Um, wait a second. I click next slide. Oh, too many. Um, okay. Anyway, we we uh, I'm gone far too far. Uh, we we got a quite a nice interaction network, and in this uh, interaction network, we um, okay. Now I'm I'm really nervous because if I click again, will it jump like too far? Okay. Um, okay. With this interaction network, and in the interaction network, surprisingly, we didn't. Uh, I've definitely clicked again, so it's going to jump. And um, we instead of having the RNA polymerase linked to the um, directly to the ribosome or through NUSG. We actually had uh, um, uh, we actually had um, cross links between the end terminus of um, of NUS A, so another um, uh, transcriptional elongation factor, to to uh, to um, mainly to the beta subunit and the alpha subunit of um, of the um, of the RNA polymerase, and then from the C terminal half of the um, of NUS A to the 30S ribosome. So this is very surprising and, and wasn't like the two previous models. The slide before this showed the whole interaction network, but uh, you'll have to go to the paper to see it. <laughs> um, OK, so this was quite surprising. And with crossing mass spectrometry gives you um, binary interactions. So it's possible that we had um, interactions between the, R the RNA polymerase and NUS A, and separately NUS A and the 30S ribosome. And there was no transcription translation coupling caught in this interaction network at all. OK. Um, no, nothing is moving. OK, so then we turn to um, to, to, to uh, our fantastic collaborators in EMBL Heidelberg, who are real pioneers of, uh, of, um, of cryo-electron tomography. So if we can get a structure of this, uh, of this, which we've discovered with, cry with uh, crossing mass spectrometry, um, we well, th this removes all doubt about if the if the, if the complex exists all in um, all together. So uh, there is a video to show that uh, this tomogram, but it's um, it's not so needed. But as you see, the um, they were able to just directly image the um, the cells on the grid, and because the um, the ribosomes are quite electron dense, so these these black black balls, you can just pick all the ribosomes. And uh, at the end, they had a 100,000 uh, ribosome subtomogram data set, which is enormous, I've been told. Um, so uh, this is quite impressive. So when they did this, they were able to, um, so they have all their ribosomes picked. They were then able to sort the ribosomes into, um, into different structural categories uh, by doing subtomogram averaging. Uh, not moving. Uh, okay. And then you see, uh, see here, they were able to find bad particles. Then they had some 50s. Then they had some 70s with something on top. They sorted this again into polys, uh, polysomes, ribosomes with an adjacent ribosome. And then they had a, um, they were able to further refine this uh, 70s class into, uh, they were, sorry, they were able to uh, further classify this into 3,000 particles that they were then able to refine into a structure. So this uh, this density on top looks um, happily very like an RNA polymerase. So they're able to get this entire structure to about uh, nine angstrom resolution, and into this uh, structure they could fit we could fit homology models of a ribosome and an RNA polymerase. Um, any second now? There we are. Importantly. Uh, when you fit it in these um, these homology models, there's there's extra density, so that they can't explain. And this, if we were going to do this project the other way around, this is where they would stop, or they would have to uh, they would have to do experiments to work out what these uh, what these extra densities are. Happily, we already had uh, the crosslinks, which give you uh, distance restraints. So what we could go through is each of the interactors to the RNA polymerase. We could map 
onto their canonical binding sites. And the cross-links would then confirm, yes, indeed, these are binding to their canonical binding sites known from other species. And this allowed us to, um, uh, this allowed us to uh, uh, narrow down that the, um, the uh, the, the subunit responsible for this density at the back, this kind of uh, horseshoe shape density here, must have been um, uh, must have been uh, Nasse. So we then turn to uh, the integrative, integrative modeling platform from Andre Sally, and we give it uh, two two uh, uh, two types of information. You have the the um, the density from the uh, from the cryo-electron tomography, and you have the distance restraints, which you want to be as many of them as possible to be satisfied. From the um, uh, from the crosslinking mass spectrometry, then you 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 fit your homology models you already have, and then you coarse grain all the other um, parts of the protein into uh, into these uh, spheres, which are between five and, and twenty uh, amino acids, and then you allow it to uh, to uh, to fit the uh, the data as best as possible, and then at the end you generate uh, um, a localization density. Which is somewhat of consensus of, of these thousands of um, of modeling runs, and here very nicely the um, the domains of Nusse fit into this uh, into this density, this horseshoe 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 shaped density between uh, between the RNA polymerase and the ribosome, and here are the uh, in dashed lines of the crosslinks, which also nicely um, uh, are, uh, nicely align with this, and then these other parts of density um, that were on the um, uh, Elsewhere around the um, the homology model uh, that we had, and um, one of them we can fit NUSG into it, and the rest um, are explained by parts of the um, of the RNA polymerase that weren't in the um, in the structural model. And then this is just the um, the uh, a different angle. Okay, so the model of um, of uh, of what we have is the, um, the the DNA goes into the RNA polymerase here. Um, exits um, exits here and uh, uh, exits on the um, the RNA polymerase here, and then the NUSA and N, N terminal domain binds to its canonical binding site, which is which is nice. The mRNA runs from the RNA polymerase to the ribosome, past the um, the mRNA binding domains of uh, um, of NUSA, and the Subunit on the on the RNA polymerase, or sorry, on the ribosome that was proposed to bind to NUSG, um, is is uh, is found very very far away. So our model doesn't um, doesn't fit with the previous models of uh, from um, from the espresso and from E. coli. This doesn't um, this doesn't mean those uh, models are necessarily wrong because these uh, these species are quite different, and there have been uh, there have been subsequent structures that have shown that actually it probably does look quite different in E. coli. Um, okay. So we were able to do some uh, some final um, final um, uh, final analyses to show that the the structure that we've uh, identified and uh, the model we have built is actually um, is actually functional. So it's elongating in, in the cell. So we, uh, previously I've, I forgot to mention that the the um, uh, the conformation of the um, of the DNA inside the inside the um, the RNA polymerase looks like it's uh, it's um, it's an elongating RNA polymerase. So this this is our model on the on the left in our in the uh, fitted in the density. We were then able to stop. We we treated the cells with antibiotics, and um, um, and we stalled uh, uh, we stalled uh, um, uh, translation with uh, chloramphenicol, and this caused the um, the ribosome to stop, and we lost the density on the top. So the RNA polymerase probably just continued on its uh, continued on its way. Then we. Well, but more interestingly, when we stopped the RNA polymerase, we got very similar to the structure that Patrick Kramer had from the stalls, um, start off, stalled off our RNA polymerase in, um, in vitro, in the in vitro transla uh, transcription translation uh, that he had solved. And this uh, this can be explained here by, um, by, the, um, by the RNA polymerase stops. It then has uh, fixed the mRNA in the RNA polymerase, and the ribosome then gets this very specific uh, confirmation, where the um, where EFG um, is uh, is bound in a pre-translocation state, where it's trying to catalyze the translocation, but it can't because the um, the mRNA is fixed. So these are quite nice results. And uh, and finally, we uh, this is uh, from the cryo-electron tomography. They were also able to show that the 
um, that the because you can count the numbers of each confirmation you have in the cell in uh, or each complex you have in the cell in RNA, um, in cryolactin tomography, they're able to show that these um, antibiotics were able to hugely sh um, uh, shift the distributions of these uh, of these different um, of these different complexes. Like now we go from having 2.8 percent uh, of particles with this quite proximal um, confirmation of the of the RNA polymerase to the ribosome to almost 40 percent. Okay, so I hope I've, I've convinced you that uh, the cross mass spectrometry now in uh, in complex mixtures can be extremely useful for for answering answering biological questions, and then in particular with uh, with cryo electron tomography, hope uh, it looks it seems to be extremely powerful. Um, and I just want to to thank everybody that was involved in the work. It's a lot of people, and it's taken many years. It was it was really a lot of work, and uh, in particular um, the members of the lab that are involved in these two complexes and with um, with EMBL, um, with Julia um, Julia's lab, and with Liang, who did the cryolactin tomography, and with um, uh, Jörg Stulke's lab um, in in Göttingen, who um, who helped us with the mycoplasma biology. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Francis. Uh, that was a great presentation. All right, so uh, I am going to. Uh, I guess move us now to the uh, discussion portion of the uh, webinar here. And uh, I mean that there is there is actually a, a lot of, of points uh, we can discuss. Uh, but I think actually, uh, Mark, there was a question for you that I, that I think uh, is is uh, important to ask here, um, and, and because it. it, it plays a, a larger role in kind of understanding uh, the HTX technology. But uh, mm -hmm. what environment is the complex one in uh, when you study it? Oh, I'm um, sorry, it's, purify, it's purified from mitochondria. So yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, not, um, it's not an in vivo uh, like Francis was talking about. Yeah, it's a purified complex. Okay, and so typically uh, with, with HTX then, are, are you required Required to do uh, these purifications? Is there any way you can kind of study uh, HDX more in its native environment? Um, well, probably. I'm not sure you could with complex one, but you know, I mean, you know, people have looked at, uh, like I said, the, the viruses and things like that. In, in and that, that, I guess, would be, you know, you, you're purifying the virus, but you know, um, yeah, I, I, I guess because you're looking at a at a differential approach all the time with this in one state or another. Um, yeah, I think with the complexes, you have to purify them. Yeah. yeah. OK, and so, um, you know, so I mean, how, the complex how, is a complex one is very active. So everything that we're looking at there, of course, it's a deactive state, but uh, the active form is, you know, it, it's it's functional is what I was trying okay. to say. OK, great. So I, I guess that, that kind of leads into to the next question here is, you know, um, how close is this confirmation uh, uh, in the uh, to like the in situ uh, uh, confirmation. So, and, and is this expected for for other proteins possibly studied? Uh, through well, I mean, it's a it's a good question for for complex one. I mean, we we draw that kind of linear <coughs> respiratory chain, but really, you know, they exist probably as super complexes. And, and Leo in uh, Leo Sazanoff in Austria has looked at these sort of when we have complex one and complex three all fitted around each other. So, you know, as a as an isolated form, of course, it is it is it is potentially not what it's like uh, within the membrane. Okay, great. And, and you know, I, I think there's uh, some parallels here that that can actually be uh, drawn to the, the cross linking that, that uh, uh, Francis uh, is doing and, and that, um, uh, you know, that, that there's Cross-linking, as I understand it, there, there's two main approaches that, that people take with uh, the, the chemical cross-linkers. One is to purify their protein and cross-link it and perhaps get a lot of structural or topological information about it. Uh, but the other is to try and capture some of these protein interactions in their, their native environment. And so then you, you get wholesale cross-linking. And, and uh, I, I guess, Francis, Mike, what? question for you would be, uh, what, you know, what do you think is the balance between these two? Is it possible that you could do kind of this native in-cell cross-linking and then perhaps an extraction, capture your proteins of interest and still get enough information to uh, inform you structurally uh, quite well on, on that protein? Yeah, I think so. I think you can do, 
you can do incel cross-linking and then do a pull down but it's it's not going to be a one it, it won't be so general i mean whenever they were doing um uh apms screens in my in my phd lab it was the same protocol for literally every um every protein because you want to do thousands of them but here it will depend on the abundance of the protein and how much it cross links to other stuff in the cell depending on its local environment so you may have to do a bit of uh, a bit of uh, optimization on each on each inter on each protein you want to pull down but it's definitely possible and and uh in cross linking you know, you just briefly mentioned it uh, uh you know that the process itself um it, uh, obviously there's a, a lot of uh, peptides in your sample uh, following digestion that are, are just not cross-linked and so the, these cross-linked peptides that you you are actually uh, hoping to see you know how how difficult is it to actually extract that information um from your samples and and uh i, I guess how much background do you have to overcome to uh, identify quality crosslinks? I think it's like 99.5% or something of all the intensity you have to throw away. It really is, um, I think a lot of other proteomics is going towards speed. You know, they want to identify things as quick as possible. For us, we're nowhere close. It really is about, uh, it is about being as sensitive as possible because all of our information is in that, uh, is in that like lowest order of magnitude that you can identify in your mass spec. Yeah. And uh, there's, I, I know that there are crosslinkers today that, that have enrichment tags uh, built into them. Yeah. And, and so that, that allows you to enrich uh, a little bit more um, for, for your uh, crosslinks uh, of interest. And, and uh, what, are, what are some of the, the, the pros and cons of, of using that approach? And, and are you familiar with it and, and seeing uh, how effective it is? Yeah, so a lot of people have published them. Well, we haven't used them yet, but a lot of people have published them and generated, you know, very um, quite simple interaction networks. Though I I don't know what um, what they're doing in Albert Hex lab at the moment. I haven't actually seen much that's come out of their new Fox crossing, which looks cool. But it doesn't get into cells. But the um, I think there's two things you have to you have to. Uh, I, I, I can't speak to which ones really work, but there's two things you'll still need to um, to work with afterwards, particularly if you do complex mixtures. One is that for, you do pull down, you pull down the modified peptides and the crossing peptides. And the modified peptides are already going to be much more abundant than the, than the crossing ones. And then secondly, you still have to deal with the entire um, uh, protein abundance, like the dynamic uh, range of the the uh, protein uh, mixture that you're, you've started with. I think you'll still need to generate enough material that you can then do all the, the fractionation we do. So I think you probably don't save, you definitely gain more, but I think if you want to be truly comprehensive, you probably don't save much in terms of mass spec time. And in a protein, individual protein complex, that's totally different. But um, we find in individual, individual protein complexes that a single step fractionation is usually enough with uh, with a crossing or that can't be can't be enriched. We usually get enough information. And uh, uh, how many how many cross links uh, do you get on average um, when when working with uh, whole cell lysates? And 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 which of those cross links do you find uh, to be useful data? On average, okay. <laughs> That's, I know it's, it's uh, difficult. It's just, it certainly uh, depends on the environment, the cell. Uh, yeah, that sort of I thing. think. Typically, if I spend with, let's just talk very, very general, you get about in the range of 10,000 crosslinks and about 2,000 of those are between uh, proteins. So you get about 8,000 uh, within protein crosslinks. And I guess people don't find those so so useful. Um, and that I would spend about at least three weeks solid on the mass spec. So to get that kind of information. But for an individual protein complex in a day, I can get about a thousand cross links. So that just tells you, um, uh, tells you what the problem is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it sounds, it sounds like a, a, a lot of effort uh, goes into it um, to really actually get the sensitivity yeah. that you need um, to, to obtain the, the cross link information. I mean, it would be it would be super useful if someone would go out and just test all of the enrichable cross linkers people had done and just see what, to see which ones work best. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to change uh, uh, topics a little bit here and, and um, talk a bit more about structure because uh, structure played an important role in, in, in both of these presentations. Um, and and 
how uh, well, I guess we'll start with you, uh, Mark. How, how reliant are you on, um, uh, on uh, good quality structure predictions and say like the PDB uh, to, to actually uh, uh, get information from HDX that, that's actionable? Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> when you're looking at what we're doing there, then we're absolutely reliant on, on the structure for PDB. But a lot of the time when we're doing these HDX and uh, and cross-linking studies, then there isn't a, 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 a structure there. And what you're what we're doing it for is to help, as, as Francis has pointed out, improve the, the distance restraints and also look for, for regions that are, that are in contact. So you don't necessarily need that. Hopefully, yes, it's very nice to be able to paint things onto onto nice uh, onto nice structures and, and you can then you can visualize some mechanisms. But most of what to be honest, most of what we do um, there isn't a structure. Certainly when we were looking at, um, at the activation of the, uh, the E3 ligase uh, park in another mitochondrial um, uh, protein, th there was no structure when we started that. So we, we, by having the right reagents, we could, we could actually work out the mechanism without a structure in the first instance. So it's not, it's not necessary, but it makes a nice picture. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. Uh, so it, it, in the absence of a, a, a structure, um, what, what sort of uh, resolutions do you think uh, that, that you can see through HDX uh, when, when kind of identifying proximal regions uh, of protein topology? Yeah, I guess somebody might have estimated. I, I wouldn't know that <laughs> in terms of angstroms. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> That might be that might be not profitable to go down that route. I yeah, all right, all right. Uh, I mean, maybe with, with, you know, when you do the high density stuff and and you can look at different crosslinker lengths, then I think there potentially you can start to come up with something. But for the HDX, I'm not I'm not so sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, then then let me pass the the, the question over to to uh, Francis and and. Um, have you worked with uh, different uh, crosslinker arm lengths and 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 seen improvements or, or limitations in the resolutions you can obtain through crosslink? I think I haven't done much work in different arm lengths, but the, the big difference I think it's like a revolutionary difference because we work quite um, uh, um, in quite close collaboration with cryoelectron microscopy labs has been moving from these homobifunctional crosslinkers with the uh, um, like BS3 or uh, like um, or DSSO that people typically use, which have NH NHS ester on both sides that are reactive in, uh, you know, they, they, they'll be active in, in water for up to an hour before they're quenched. So they'll link on one side on a maybe a lysine and then the other side just hangs around waiting for something to link to. So it may find a quite a, a rare confirmation and then uh, and then link um, uh, whenever this confirmation happens, then link to another um, to another residue. What we have uh, had much more success in recently is uh, is photo uh, photo cross linking with with like maybe sulfur SDA or SDA, where you add um, where it, it links on one side, so it labels the protein on one side with an NHS ester, and then the other side has a diazerine, and this will only um, uh, will only react with the nearest with the nearest atom whenever you um, whenever you UV cross link. Actually, yeah, there's a slide here <laughs> on this. Um, so, uh, so on the top, this is the difference: standard cross-linking, where you have nucleophilic um, reaction, so both of them react are available to react in the solution uh, right away. And then the other side, photo cross-linking, where it labels on one side, and then then you put it under a UV lamp, and it will um, it will it will react with whatever buffer, anything nearby. So it has to be actually touching another residue at the point a photon hits it, and this makes it quite specific. So if if you go to the next slide, we have actually where we worked in co um, condensin, and that not only has the effect of um, of giving you more uh, reliable crosslinks, so those that aren't uh, don't contain much of this uh, aren't so artifactual. It also gives this fanning out effect, so you get much more um, uh, structural information from a single a single area. So see, there's much higher density here in the sulfur SDA crosslinking. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, so how much? Cross-linking information. Do you think it would take to uh, kind of reverse the process, go from from cross-linking to structure, rather than starting with a structure and refining it with cross-linking? Cross-linking to structure. You mean with only with only cross-linking? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so so structural prediction, uh, things like that, using using distance restraints obtained, uh, especially if you can obtain really tight restraints. 
uh, with some of these uh, photoreactive uh, crosslinkers? Um, well, we, we did, uh, uh, not, not me, but people in the lab did try this years ago where they did it with, um, with HSA. And uh, you know they 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 generated I think a thousand crosslinks for a small you know relatively small protein, and they had some success with this. Um, where I mean I think it's kind of unknown, right? Because now you have uh, you have alpha folds, you have amazing uh, amazing technology there. If you can mix uh, crosslinking based distance restraints with that, who knows? Um, Great. Sorry, I'm I'm, I'm asking uh, uh, tough questions. I'm I'm, I'm trying to. Get your opinion as to like the where the field's going and and what what is possible with uh, these technologies, not just what we've yeah, done, yeah. but where we can where we can go with them. Uh, uh, well, Mark, yeah, I, uh, think, I think what Francis has been doing with the, with the modeling stuff is 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 probably where where we should be going. Actually, combining several techniques and then going down the the route of of Sally's stuff, I think it is quite interesting. Actually, I agree. I, I definitely. Agree with that. Uh, Mark, uh, where do you think um, uh, HDX uh, could improve the most um, to handle complicated samples, like the most complicated samples? Would it be uh, more technology on the MS side or better chromatography? Uh, you certainly so showed us the difficulty with, with chromatography on such short lengths. Well, yeah, I'm not sure how you get, I'm sure some bright spark will come up with an idea of doing it, but I, I, I'm, <laughs> I think at the moment that the sort of move forward will be through um, actually like this sort of eye mobility instrumentation and, and then the software to analyze it downstream. I think that's, yeah, that, that, that's probably where the, the, the first moves are going to come. Yeah. 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 So in, in terms of, of software analysis downstream, uh, what, what options are available to researchers? Uh, well, I mean, there are a number of things out there. There's, of course, there's um, Sierra Analytics, um, um, uh, HD Examiner, and, and we, we, I mean, we primarily have been using the Waters Dynamics, but I'm not sure how much development they're, they're doing with that at the moment. And then there's, there's Workbench as well. So there are, there are a few things out there, but not a, potentially not a huge number, not as many as the, as the cross-linking environment, I don't think. Yeah. Well, I can tell you from experience in the cross-linking environment that the software field has exploded the past few years, and it, it's actually made us all better for it, I, I think, um, that, that we have that competition kind of driving us forward. Um, and, and it went from a few years ago from just developing algorithms that, that could identify cross-links to, to uh, what Francis is getting at today uh, uh, at the start of his, which is the importance of validation reducing the false positives that that uh, people see and identify. So yeah, I don't know if you could, uh, Francis, uh, kind of uh, discuss, you know, just the importance of, of, of getting those false discovery rates as low as possible and the importance of validation. Like, is it is it really important to throw away a lot of the ambiguous data and just focus on the few cross links you can trust the most? Or do you want to actually have that ambiguity in there and, and do the testing downstream with other experiments? I think it depends on, on what you're doing afterwards. I think in my experience for, for I want to use these, uh, these interact, if we're talking about protein interactions, I want to validate some of them. So I want, I would rather throw away um, all the ambigu ambiguous stuff and only validate things that were really there. Um, obviously, that's that's a um, that's an overly harsh statement, but I you know I really go for one percent false discovery rates uh, often. So the I think that uh, and this has also been the case when I deal with collaborators in cryo EM. They really you can uh, think of statistical frameworks where you could do you know leave one out analysis and you could do modeling like this. But typically, they're super happy if I just give them something as nailed on as possible, right? So um, you need to have, well, there's there's a caveat. You need to have enough data to be able to estimate your FDR accurately at a low level, right? So you can't have a sink, you can't have a hundred links and then one decoy and say that's accurately estimating one percent FDR, right? You could maybe have to go to five percent or something there. Um, but uh, I've lost my lost my train of thought. Train of thought. Um, we. Uh, Anyway, yeah, did I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, it, it, you, you take the more the more strict approach, uh, and yes. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it really depends. Like, it's the nice thing is that we um, in cross-linking mass spectrometry compared to APMS, you can really rely on your on your false discovery rate. So then you can you can 
you can like modulate it to whatever uh, you need for your for your analysis, right? That's what we've that's what we've shown. Excellent, excellent. Uh, all right, so kind of uh, uh, this this might be uh, you know a, a bit more vague uh, a topic of discussion, but but it it seems like the, these two technologies, the HDX and crosslinking, you, you've each presented them. Um, uh, you know, as their uses kind of independent of each other, but they seem very complementary. Um, it seems like these two technologies together have a, a synergy that that could actually benefit. Um, you know, just not just structure refinement, but but also conformational modeling. Uh, that that's it. so. Uh, you know, what are your opinions, or, or what are the, the the chances of seeing these technologies interact more in the future? Well, I mean, yes, absolutely, it should. We, we've done that in a number of occasions that we use both techniques, um, and I think we should potentially make more of that. That it does tend. To, the, the issue sometimes is that, you know, what the question you're asking is more suited to one technique or the other. Uh, HDX is also not light on protein, <laughs> so you know sometimes we need a little bit more than you, you might imagine. But um, I, we have we have combined the approaches in, in a few experiments. I, I think it's a good way to go. Thank you. I think a collaborator of ours has just submitted a paper with both both techniques in it. I think right. <laughs> <laughs> Independently, we didn't know, but uh, yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd like to thank both of you for uh, uh, your presentations today and and for uh, the wonderful discussions that that, that we've uh, been having afterwards. Um, yeah, and I guess at, at this point, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Joanna. Great, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, so as mentioned earlier, we will have a form for those requiring certificates of attendance, which will uh, be accessible for just a few minutes after we wrap up. Um, and as Michael said, thanks so much to our speakers and, uh, and um, thanks to Michael for the very lively discussion. Thanks to everyone who came along and to those committee members who are working away in the background to make this webinar possible.